for us at the Middle East Institute to uh, welcome uh, uh, Dr. Arabia to MEI today. Uh, he's in uh, Washington for a few days before he goes to New York uh, for some meetings uh, on the margins of the General Assembly and then on to, to Brussels to talk to our friends in the, in the European Union. I could probably spend uh, the entire hour uh, just reviewing uh, the high points of Dr. Rabia's uh, career uh, as a pediatric surgeon, as the Minister of Health in Saudi Arabia, uh, as an advisor uh, to King Salman, and now, of course, as the uh, Director uh, General of the King Salman Center for Humanitarian Assistance. Uh, but, uh, um, but rather than do that, I think that uh, we should uh, turn the microphone over to Dr. Rabia to make a few introductory remarks, uh, and then uh, we will want to give everybody here as much of an opportunity as possible to engage in a conversation um, and, uh, and to really make this into a, a kind of a dialogue. Uh, it is being filmed. We will be posting this on our website uh, after the event today. Uh, and so uh, we have microphones at, uh, at each of the tables, and uh, please do use the microphones when you're asking your questions or making your comments. And as always, uh, signal your interest by raising your, uh, your name ten. But without further ado, uh, let me turn this over to Dr. Rabia uh, for his uh, opening remarks. Well, uh, thank you, Ambassador Ferstein, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm really happy to be here today, uh, happy to share with you uh, some of uh, the activities that uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is doing. I have taken the permission uh, from Your Excellency just to take a few minutes just to brief you about the center. I'm really happy to see some of the names uh, today who are uh, true partners of the center. Uh, King Salman Humanitarian Aid and Relief Center is a center that is recently established. Uh, it was established in May 13, uh, 2015 uh, by uh, a royal decree from His Majesty uh, King Salman uh, with the intention to ensure that the uh, humanitarian aid of Saudi Arabia is uh, uh, streamed and lined in one body and also to ensure that we also uh, uh, really uh, coordinating our efforts with our partners, namely the UN organizations. And from uh, day one, uh, His Majesty directed the center to uh, abide with the humanitarian, international humanitarian law. And also we have been uh, directed to be impartial in all uh, of our activities. Our activities are not linked with any political or military motives. Uh, the uh, center uh, started from the scratch, and thanks to our great partners, and I want to uh, say this with confidence, USAID, uh, DFID, and uh, the uh, main UN organizations, from day one they uh, came and put hand in hand with us to build capacity, to share information, and uh, to work uh, uh, in uh, the benchmarks of the international, international standards. With, those, uh, sub with this support, the center started its work. It wasn't the best time. We started with the major issues in the region, as you would imagine. We have um, issues in Syria, we have issues in Yemen, and we have issues in Iraq, and also the issues that you know and know in, in Africa, drought and other issues. But I think with the support of our partners and with the dedication of uh, our grateful staff, we managed to start our work in Yemen. In Yemen, uh, to date, we have been active in all regions of Yemen, and I want to put a few lines under this. We work in the north and the south equally. We have not given any preference to any region, and, and our uh, partners can confess to that. Uh, we have uh, concentrated our work in Yemen to alleviate the suffering of the Yemeni people. Uh, we, uh, as you know, there are very strong ties between the Yemeni uh, people and the Saudis, uh, which goes for decades. Saudi Arabia has ties, uh, which is uh, language, religion, neighborhood, family ties, economic ties, you name it. 
and uh, all those ties tells you how much bonding between the two nations. And that's why we have three million Yemenis living in Saudi Arabia. This is how much we, we are linked together. So with those principles, we started our work in Yemen. Uh, we have concentrated, as you would imagine, with food security, shelter, health, uh, nutrition, uh, and also uh, uh, supporting IDPs and refugees. The center has also concentrated uh, heavily uh, uh, on uh, women-focused programs, child-focused programs. By the way, you have uh, a PowerPoint presentation that you could uh, look at it. Uh, I will not go in the details of it. And also we have uh, uh, focused uh, some programs to the Yemeni refugees outside Yemen. We are the main players for the Yemeni refugees in Djibouti, which we provided them with shelter and health and food. The same thing has done for the Yemeni refugees in, in Somalia. And whether you know it or not, we have a lot of refugees from Yemen and Syria and Saudi Arabia. We have 603,000 Yemeni refugees uh, in Saudi Arabia. We have 291,000 Syrian refugees in Saudi Arabia. If we add them together, they constitute 4.5% of the Saudi nationals. So it's a, it's a significant percentage. The center has worked very uh, heavily to, to ensure that they get social benefits. The refugees get uh, a free uh, uh, pub, uh, public health uh, services. And also they get, uh, their children get uh, a free education in, in our public schools. In addition to that, they can access our uh, workforce and compete with the Saudi nationals in, in any work that they, will, uh, they have the capability to do. Uh, uh, I want also to emphasize that some of the important programs that we have carried, as you have, have seen the recent reports from the human rights groups about uh, using children in, in armed conflicts and also uh, shields uh, in, in, in by the militias, uh, Houthi militias. The, and the last report I have read, I think uh, last week, 20,000 plus has been used by the Houthi militias. We have started programs with our partners to rehabilitate those children. We just graduated 2,000 children from those programs, uh, a program that in includes psychological, social, educational, uh, to ensure those children will go back to their childhood life. Uh, we will continue to support the children of, the mar uh, of Yemen, mothers of, of Yemen, uh, and also uh, uh, be with them. Uh, before I conclude, also I want to emphasize our efforts in cholera. Um, I will just talk as a doctor. I am very acquainted with Yemen, as you know, Your Excellency. I have been visiting Yemen for years prior to, 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 to the conflict. Uh, I have visited uh, the main hospital in Sana'a, Athora Hospital, as to train doctors in Yemen. So I know the health system. Uh, Yemen did not have a good health system or any infrastructure to start with. They have uh, very poor uh, uh, infrastructures, including health, and diseases like uh, malaria, uh, dengue fever, and cholera were endemic in Yemen for, for, for years. They, are not, they did not leave Yemen for, for years. However, there has been an epidemic in, in cholera in, in the last few months, and the center has responded immediately to, to the call for help. Uh, we are the first uh, organization to mobilize 550 tons of medical supplies to Yemen, and that has been delivered to all regions of Yemen. In addition, we have supported our uh, uh, great partner, WHO, uh, with 8.2 million US dollars to help the surveillance and also pay the salaries of the health workers working against cholera. And also we have responded fully to the pledge by UNICEF and WHO by supporting them uh, uh, by the pledge they requested 66.7 US million US dollars. Uh, we also uh, are paying attention to the access. These are the last two points I'll talk about are access uh, and also uh, decentralization of, of uh, humanitarian work. Access has been an issue in Yemen and, and has taken attention, but 
in the PowerPoint presentation you have, if you can look at it now, there is a map of Yemen which shows that Yemen has nine ports. Hodeida is only one of them. We, we actually, Hodeida is functioning, but we would like to see it functioning in its full capacity. And we hope that the initiative by Ismail Wildi Sheikh uh, to uh, have the new guidelines for, for Al Hodeida port and hopefully the installment of the cranes. Till that happens, we have eight other ports which we strongly feel they should be also used fully. In addition, if you look at the uh, upside, just close to the border of Yemen, there is a dot which shows you the port of Jizan, which is much larger port than any other port in Yemen. That port is far, is much closer to the north of Yemen than any other port in Yemen. We are telling our partners, please use us. We will help the delivery of humanitarian aid to any region of Yemen. We have Jizan port and we have the land ports, which we feel that they are, can be utilized fully uh, to help uh, bring actually uh, uh, the, uh, essential items to, to the nation of Yemen. Last is the uh, decentralization of, human, uh, of humanitarian work. I have talk to uh, our great partners from the UN, uh, and I think they are responding now. Uh, I have been talking to them for the last year and a half. Their offices are located in Sana'a, and whether we like it or not, they recruit local workers. And local workers, whether we like it or not, they will be politically motivated one way or the other. If we have more offices in Aden, Hudayda, Ta'az, then we have a bigger picture of Yemen and probably better improvement of, of care. I think some of the UN organizations started to have offices outside Sana'a and hopefully they will have probably more broad picture of, of Yemen than only having it from uh, uh, Sana'a. I think uh, I will stop here, Your Excellency, because otherwise I will be lecturing the whole hour. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Rabia, and, uh, and again, uh, for those of you who have questions or comments, please uh, uh, signify by raising your, uh, your name ten. But let me, uh, let me start, and, and you, you touched on, uh, on, I think, part of the answer. Uh, let me note that uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, by your statistics, has provided about $850 million over the last two years. Uh, to uh, help address the humanitarian crisis in, uh, in Yemen. Uh, the rest of the international community has also uh, provided a great deal of assistance. Uh, and yet we see that the, um, that the, uh, that the issues, the humanitarian issues in, in Yemen uh, continue and in many ways are, are getting worse. And so uh, I guess my, my question to you would be, uh, how can the international community, even within the context of the ongoing conflict and the lack of political progress, how can the international community come together to try to address these humanitarian requirements and to at least alleviate the needs uh, of the Yemeni people while we uh, hopefully sort out the political issues? Thank you, Your Excellency. I think uh, it's a very important question and genuine question. Uh, let me just correct the numbers. Saudi Arabia has supported Yemen in the last two and a half years with 8.27 billion US dollars. Uh, what you have said is only the humanitarian right. sector, but we have supported also uh, refugees. We have supported Central Bank. We have a bilateral right. government support, so there is a lot of support to Yemen. But the humanitarian, you are correct. And the numbers are clear in the PowerPoint presentation you have. Now, I think if we look at the pledge by the UN for 2017, it's 2.3 billion US dollars. Thanks to the US, Saudi Arabia, UK, they are the highest donors for this pledge. Uh, we pledged 150 million US dollars. And to date, we have paid 221. So we, are, we have surpassed our pledge. And we are still a little bit over half of the year, so we have more months to come. So I would imagine if we come to end of December, you'll see that number change significantly. Now, I urge all uh, international community and donors to do what the U.S. 
UK and Saudi Arabia are doing. I think it shouldn't be only three or four countries donating and the rest are watching. I think we should encourage all players to, to help. This is uh, an, 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 an issue that has been raised by the UN and we should seek all help that comes. We will continue in Saudi Arabia to support the Yemeni people. I'm sure the US and the UK are, are doing, uh, and the UAE, and we hope to see more from regional countries and international countries to, 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 to do that. But to add to that, Your Excellency, is also, it's not only the funding which is important. I think the coordination process, uh, the work uh, to get its maximum benefit, you have you should have better coordination and also better access. And that's why I'm, we're helping. We're saying we'll, we'll use Jizan, we'll use the land ports, any port. And also, uh, we should coordinate the work. And also, we have a coordinating office in the center for the GCC countries. Getting help, We are getting help from OCHA and also thanks to USAID AID and DFID. We think this coordination should uh, expand to improve the process of, of, of uh, delivery. And we coordinate our work, whether it is through the UN or, or bilateral. No, and I think this is important for all uh, players. Okay. Uh, well, let me uh, uh, ask, uh, and you, you again, you noted the, uh, the availability of, of um, other ports. Uh, but we also know that Hodeida um, is historically the uh, main port of uh, entry for northern uh, Yemen, uh, serving about 75 percent of the Yemeni people. Uh, uh, early on in the conflict, there was uh, destruction of the uh, gantry cranes that are used to unload cargo. It's reduced the, uh, it's reduced the, uh, the effectiveness of Hodeida. Um, there are uh, cranes supplied by the U.S. government in the region uh, now uh, in the possession of the World Food Program. Uh, the U.N. has put on the table a proposal that would allow a third party to operate the uh, Hodeida port as well as Sana'a Airport and uh, bring the port back to full functioning. Uh, Saudi Arabia, along with the coalition, has uh, supported uh, mm -hmm. that, uh, that initiative by the United Nations. Uh, could you update us on where we, uh, where we stand and, and whether uh, uh, this is something that we believe is going to actually happen? Well, the immediate answer is I hope it, it happens. I, had, I hope it happens tomorrow or even today. Uh, as you uh, rightly stated that the coalition, uh, international community, UN, all have agreed on, on, on the new uh, uh, initiative uh, by the UN and by Ismail al Sheikh, uh, and we hope to see that being implemented. Uh, but let me also give you a little bit of the statistics of Hudaydah to make the picture better. Uh, by the way, till today, Hudaydah is not fully utilized. In spite of its handicap, it's not fully utilized. Uh, as I'm getting those data from OCHA and from EHOC. The uh, data is that Hodeida is only receiving 44% of the shipments. The rest of the ports are receiving the remaining percentage. And if we go in the details of those 44%, uh, whether we like it or not, it are not food or medical supplies. The, sh the biggest shipments, and you can look at those statistics from OCHA records, are building materials and cars. Well, uh, there was a report in the media, I think yes, last, yesterday or the day before yesterday, 15 ships carrying food and uh, medical supplies are delayed by those who are controlling the port and giving priority to non-essential items uh, carried by other ships. And uh, it's not a secret, some of the uh, organizations and businessmen are paying dues in Hodeida up to 100,000 US dollars per ship to up download in, 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 in Hodeida. And that's why Ismail Wild Sheikh bringing a proposal to ensure the better utilization. We hope to see that proposal comes on the table. We hope to see also the cranes come and also uh, Saudi Arabia has 
directed case relief in other uh, players in Saudi Arabia to install four other cranes uh, in, in Aden, Al Makha, and Mukalla. We want to see better capacity for Yemen. We want to see more access. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, I don't want to repeat it. We should use all available ports, including Jezan and the land ports. And we hope to see Hudaida functions uh, fully uh, uh, soon. Wendy. <clears throat> Thank you very much uh, for honoring us with your presence here today, but also for all the work you do uh, in humanitarian affairs in this very troubled region, particularly Yemen. Uh, before coming to the Middle East Institute, I was in Geneva with the UNHCR for three years, and I know how difficult these issues are. One of the um, discussions that uh, we would have uh, quite a bit within the UN Refugee Agency was uh, protection of humanitarian workers uh, in difficult situations. In fact, the very first day that I arrived as the Deputy High Commissioner, we lost a, a young woman in uh, Kandahar uh, to assassination by the Taliban. It, it's it's a very difficult to protect uh, humanitarian workers and uh, any historical um, unspoken uh, principle of protecting uh, humanitarian workers seems to have, <laughs> in today's environment of uh, terrorists and non-state actors, seems to have gone by the way. Um, could you tell me as much as you can about what uh, the mechanisms are uh, with the Saudi military uh, and the other Gulf state militaries in the UAE uh, for identifying where hospitals are, where humanitarian workers are, where feeding stations are, where refugees might be, and how to how to uh, stay away from those areas. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate you bringing this important uh, point, and uh, we also feel sorry for humanitarian workers who uh, suffer the uh, not only the pressure, the risk of life. Uh, in all regions that they work in uh, globally. And this is something that is really not acceptable. Uh, and I'm sure you can see uh, in the uh, presentation you have, there are uh, uh, quite several uh, major incidents that has happened in Yemen, which we condemn and, uh, and not uh, approve or accept, which affected either our workers or uh, our uh, uh, grateful uh, partners. Uh, with the uh, work that we do uh, as a center. Uh, we are coordinating very closely with the coalition. Uh, the, there is actually a military civilian coordinating office. There is also a humanitarian coordinating office with the coalition. And recently after my meeting with Ms. Gamba from the UN uh, for the children, we, there has been an installment uh, as, as early as last week of a child protection unit in the coalition. All of these activities are there to protect civilians and to protect targets. Uh, also, in addition to that, uh, uh, there is a strong coordination between the UN organizations, international NGOs, uh, 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 through us and directly with the coalition to uh, uh, protect important targets. In the presentation you have, you will see what the UN, and this is from OCHA, the UN requested uh, and uh, 20,000 non-strike uh, zones, and these include, as you rightly stated, hospitals, historical sites, schools. In addition to those, there is another 23,000 sites requested by, by other NGOs, which was also respected. So 43,000 sites. We will respect and will acknowledge any important civilian or, or site that is important for the protection of Yemeni people and will coordinate it directly with the coalition. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Rubia and uh, Tom. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sir, I was quite interested in, and I must say surprised by, the numbers you gave for um, Syrian refugees in Saudi Arabia. I, I think it's fair to say that most of the people I talk to in this country have been critical of Saudi Arabia, saying that Saudi Arabia hasn't done its part. 
to help us here. Who are those people and how did they get to Saudi Arabia? Well, those people are refugees who have escaped the uh, conflict in Syria and they have uh, crossed the borders through the of Saudi Arabia based on request on the borders. There is, we coordinate, by the way, with the Ministry of Interior of Saudi Arabia in the borders, and they have been allowed uh, visitor access uh, from the government of Saudi Arabia. Uh, and they stayed in Saudi Arabia, so we worked as a center to ensure that they get the social rights. Uh, they are not in camps. They are integrated in the society of Saudi Arabia. And also, recently, they have been given also resident status in Saudi Arabia, both the Yemenis and, and Syrians. Uh, this is a, a, to ensure that those people will live peacefully and comfortably in, in Saudi Arabia. They represent different regions of Syria. Uh, they are families, uh, children, mothers, and their parents with them. And uh, we, ha we are taking, actually, uh, we have an office that will accept any communication with, with them. Uh, our public relations department has uh, visited randomly some of those families. And, to, and also, uh, when a, a team from the UNHCR came to us, we, we actually offered that they can interview some of those uh, uh, refugees. We're working with the UNHCR to ensure that Saudi Arabia will get the credits in answer to your question for having those refugees because we did not sign the agreement uh, of refugees, as you know, uh, and that's why we gave them the visitor status and now the resident status. We hope with the UNHCR uh, communication, this information will be on, on the website of the UNHCR. Did they come all the way across Iraq or Jordan? Yes, yes. Well, slightly related to this, I, I wonder if you had a chance to uh, visit the Hill and speak to members of Congress about your activities, given congressional concerns about the Saudi war effort in Yemen. Yes, I did. Uh, we have been busy in the last two. The embassy uh, kept me busy, and we, uh, we were open and frank and transparent uh, uh, with the uh, advisors in the, in the Congress. Uh, we had, uh, I think, uh, quite a few meetings. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I have two questions. One, about the context of this aid program uh, within Saudi Arabia, both sort of historically and institutionally. Uh, this program that you're talking about, obviously, is mainly focused on Yemen, mainly focused on the last few years where there's been a war uh, in Yemen. I wonder if you could give us a bit of context before the war in Yemen, what was the profile of uh, Saudi aid, that humanitarian aid, that also comes to how much is uh, current Saudi humanitarian aid going through the King Salman Center? Are all the statistics from the center, or there's other uh, arms of U.S. of Saudi humanitarian aid that are not the King Salman Center, and what's the arrangement? Uh, the second question relates uh, to to. Yemen and the Saudi effort there. A lot of humanitarian aid, whether it's in Syria or other places, there's some that's emergency and relief and food and water and housing, but there's things that are more related to development uh, uh, so that people can rebuild economies, some of its reconstruction, some of its investment, some of its infrastructure. Uh, is that going through a different part of the Saudi effort? It's not King Salman Center. What can you tell us about that? Thank you uh, for this, those two important questions. Uh, let, I mean, the history of Saudi Arabia in, in aid is, is, is goes back to decades, and Saudi Arabia has been, uh, I'm sure if you read the reports of UNDP, uh, at least in the last two decades, you'll find Saudi Arabia has always been, uh, has always met or exceeded the target 0.7% uh, requirement uh, by the UN for aid. As a matter of fact, in 2014, it was 1.9, so it is very high. Uh, and uh, before the center, it was going through multiple agencies. It was going through Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, Red Crescent of Saudi Arabia, Ministry of Health, uh, and also the Saudi National Campaign. 
since the inception of the center, there is now continuing streamlining of that process to be solely in the uh, center. Uh, at the moment, I would say most, but not all, the aid is going through it. Just only two weeks ago, the Saudi National Campaign has been added to the center, so that will give us another also bigger task. And the aim ultimately that all aid of Saudi Arabia will be the, through the center. So I would say now 70% of the aid of Saudi Arabia goes to the center, but it will be 100% soon. Now, with respect to, to uh, uh, also the spread, historically, Saudi Arabia has been spreading globally uh, uh, to more than 80 countries in the last uh, two or three decades. And, and uh, uh, the center in two and a half years is now present in 38 countries. So this is how much work that the center is, is working in. Uh, with respect to development, we don't do development, uh, the center. We are only humanitarian and relief. We do a little bit of recovery, but not, not beyond that. Uh, we are working actually uh, in another major important project with the Bill Gates Foundation. Uh, and together with the, uh, uh, some GCC countries and Islamic Bank, uh, in a recovery program that will reach more than 50 countries globally. And we supported that initially with 100 million US dollars. So did Bill Gates Foundation and others. And uh, uh, the development is done by the uh, Saudi Development uh, Fund. Uh, but for Yemen, and this is important, and thank you for raising it, uh, we have the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia has established uh, a, cen a new center, which is called uh, the Center for Rebuilding of Yemen. So it is planning as we speak to have plans to rebuild Yemen. We hope that this conflict will end today before tomorrow. And the plans will be ahead to ensure that there is a re uh, rebuilding process for Yemen. Could you talk to us a little bit about what those plans might be for rebuilding Yemen? Well, uh, uh, the plans are many, I think. Uh, uh, I'm not the person to answer that question because I'm not the head of that center, mm -hmm. but I know uh, of uh, record that uh, uh, they are meeting with both uh, the Ministry of Planning of Yemen and also uh, uh, some of the uh, GCC countries to see the priorities of the uh, country of Yemen and also uh, uh, start having uh, uh, funding available to start some of the most important priorities for Yemen. Naturally, health, schooling is, will take the uh, biggest priority in those areas. And uh, I know that the center is working uh, very efficiently and actively, and it is only six months old. Interesting. Uh, can I go ahead and, and follow up on that? And, and um, one of the one of the challenges that we've we've had over these years is that Saudi Arabia's preference that you touched on of of doing um, its assistance programs on a bilateral basis and not uh, through pledges to the United Nations funds or to the other international organizations has sometimes meant that Saudi Arabia's contributions haven't been recognized. Uh, and uh, for example, I was reading uh, a, an article uh, the other day that uh, was saying that Saudi Arabia has only given 1.4% of the humanitarian assistance to, to Yemen, uh, which we know is, uh, is a vast underestimate of the, of the role that you've played. Uh, you talked a little bit about, about the plans going forward, about the intention of the King Salman Center uh, to really expand um, the, uh, the scope and the, uh, and the breadth of, of assistance programs that Saudi Arabia will engage in. Uh, you talked a little bit about the cooperative relationship with USAID and DFID. Uh, how, how do you see the Salman Center developing over these coming years in terms of its integration into the larger international humanitarian community. Thank you, Your Excellency. Uh, it's clear to us now that we cannot work without the international community. I mean, this center is here to bring a strong 
connections with the international community, and that's why we called upon USAID, DFID, and, and the own organizations from day one that we wanted their help, and we share all of our information with them uh, openly. Uh, the, the Saudi Arabia has, uh, has uh, I think, done a lot in the past, rightly said, and we did not take credit for it uh, for many reasons. First of all, in the past, as you mentioned, uh, many sectors are doing humanitarian work and, and nobody paid attention to registering that globally. And, and you, you understand all this. Now the center is building this relation trying to do it streamlined through the international way and building this relation with the UN organizations. And I'm sure day after day, the understanding of the center and, and, and also uh, the UN is looking at it as, as a partner is becoming stronger. We are now registering uh, our, our, our data and we are also working on uh, 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 a website that will record all of the aid of Saudi Arabia, which will be openly to the public, and you will see it openly. Uh, the center, this will take you know a few months, but you will see it openly, and I'm sure uh, this data will be well connected with the UN. Now, you mentioned also how much of our work with the UN it's increasing. Actually, if you look at Yemen, more is being done with the UN now than before, and. The one which we do bilaterally, also we do it with them openly. So the coordinating office in, in our center discusses even the bilateral work. So it's not done under shadow. We, we are very open and transparent. And uh, I'm sure uh, this center uh, is in the way to be like you know uh, uh, our partners, uh, USAID and DFID. We, we want to see us in, in their uh, level that they have, they have accumulated over the years. Oh, Ahmed. Thank you very much for coming to MEI <coughs> and talking about this important issue. Uh, my name is Ahmed Majidior and I'm the director of uh, Iran Observe project here. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, first, if you could uh, uh, talk a little more about the uh, state and also challenges of internally displaced, uh, displaced people in, in Yemen, uh, and also your organization's uh, assistance, uh, relief assistance to those people. As a former uh, employee of UNHCR and other aid organization, I've noticed that while the refugee issue often makes headlines, and if not sufficient uh, support, uh, the plight of the IDPs are, is usually ignored. Uh, and secondly, uh, related to question that was asked before, uh, President Trump reiterated yesterday at the United Nations General Assembly that his administration prefers to help the refugees in the region rather than bringing refugees to the United States. So have, has your organization or has the uh, Saudi government received any or been pledged to increase cooperation from the US government to help the refugees and IDPs in Yemen and Syria. Yes. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you, Ahmed. <laughs> thank you, Ahmed. Uh, well, we, we help uh, IDPs in Yemen. As you know, the status of IDPs in Yemen, uh, as you know, uh, the bulk of them actually are from Tahiz, who have flown to different parts of Yemen, uh, and especially after the siege. Uh, and uh, they are a significant number. We are providing them with full support, whether it is through uh, the UN or, or uh, through uh, local or international NGOs. Uh, our great partner is UNHCR. Uh, qu quite several programs and projects are, are, are signed with them and they are executing it uh, efficiently in Yemen. And also we have a bilateral programs, but we don't execute it ourselves. We have NGOs. And the NGOs that we work on are also, uh, uh, we check, the, they are usually the ones that UN is working with them. So they are not uh, unknown NGOs. And uh, we have in Yemen 86 partners in Yemen. Globally, we have 108 partners. And those partners are well known to all of our uh, uh, UN partners and, and also USAID and others. They are on our website, so they are not secret. Uh, and uh, 
Uh, this support to the IDPs, the bulk need for them is food, health, and nutrition. This is the bulk need of, of, of course, uh, shelter is, is, is important. Uh, your other second question that uh, uh, we actually value the support of the U.S. to uh, uh, the pledging of Yemen. Uh, as you know, U.S., I think, pledged uh, in 2015. Correct me if I'm wrong. It's uh, around 100 million, probably, maybe. For humanitarian aid? Yes. I think it's more than that. It was about 150 million. Yeah, yeah. Yes, okay, so we are almost close. So 150 million. I'm sure part of that will go to uh, Yemeni refugees and IDPs. Uh, we did not communicate with the U.S. about getting support for the refugees in Saudi Arabia. I think Saudi Arabia is through the center and through the country were uh, doing uh, our part, uh, and uh, I think we should concentrate on the IDPs in Yemen and refugees of Yemen outside Saudi Arabia. Okay. Uh, Ms. Thomas? Yeah, um, I'm Lynn Marie Thomas from USAID OFTA. And I just want Thank you. A, a high level from USAID. So thank you. Could, could you uh, talk a little bit about uh, the October 29th event? Do you want to talk? Or <laughs> <laughs> you talk. <laughs> well, we're, we're, partic we're particularly uh, interested in, in participating and at a high level because as, I, as we understand it, it's about uh, um, the issue of coordination. Sure in Yemen and looking at that more closely and looking at ways we can improve coordination, uh, particularly among donor countries as well as with our implementing partners. Can I comment on Please. Well, uh, thank you, Lynn. And uh, Lynn has been with us from day one, actually, and uh, she has done a lot to the center and uh, we value her presence and she will be also on the uh, event in, in, in October. Thank you for uh, being involved with us and also we thank all of our partners who have responded. It's a high level workshop that uh, the center is, is organizing which will uh, have an attendance uh, from uh, the Yemeni government, high level attendance. It will have uh, attendance from the UN, from our partners USAID and DFID. We hope to see presence from uh, the European Union also. And also, we will have representation also from the coalition. And, and I have invited also Ms. Gamba uh, 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 to have attendance and also site events for uh, uh, training our center about the well-being and protection of children. So it's an important, the, this event is, as uh, Lynn mentioned, we have, uh, everybody knows that the biggest challenge for any humanitarian work is coordination and access. So this will be in the hot points of that uh, meeting. I have a, I have kind of an off the wall uh, question and comment to make. Uh, when I was in the United Nations uh, refugee, one of my favorite colleagues was a Saudi woman, um, Taraya Obed. She was uh, Secretary General of the Women's uh, uh, for, for all of the UN. She was amazing. But I, I don't recall any Saudis who worked for UNHCR, and I was nominally overseeing uh, human resources at that time. Uh, I, I know there's a lot of young people in Saudi Arabia. There's a lot of unemployment. Uh, there's a lot, many, many, many young Saudis who want to do and give and be a part of something bigger than they are. Uh, what better idea, solution, would there be than to get more young Saudi people into the UN system, uh, into the NG into NGOs the, that are working in places like uh, Yemen and Syria and Jordan, where, where their uh, Arabic languages would be highly valued. Um, it, is there an, an effort to do that? 
uh, is there is there a spirit of volunteerism of service that could be further developed within uh, Saudi Arabia so that uh, so that you're not just a checkbook writer uh, because you're not you're so much more you have a wonderful talent uh, within your young people who could make such a great contribution thank you Wendy I think uh, your statements about Soraya is well taken and she deserves it she's great and uh, we have many women like Soraya uh, and uh, who will be an asset to the international humanitarian work, including UNHCR. Uh, yes, we have forgotten that side for a long time, but thanks to uh, our government, especially with the Vision 2030, and also the drive by Crown Prince to ensure the quick implementation of Vision 2030. Uh, if you look at that Vision 2030, uh, it's uh, part of it, there is a lot of emphasis on volunteer work and on humanitarian work, and we have been tasked on that as a center, or, or actually partly tasked with that. Uh, and in that regard, we, as a center, we're working in two parallel uh, programs. Dr. Agil was with me, but he just went to New York to attend a quick meeting. Uh, he, he's actually involved in that uh, program. Uh, the center started. Uh, uh, a humanitarian volunteer program. We are putting the guidelines for it. We're coordinating with our partners, and anybody who can help will be appreciated. This volunteer program will uh, uh, train y uh, young Saudi uh, girls and boys to ensure that they become an asset for uh, international organizations to, to, to uh, be in the field of aid. So the center is, is working. Uh, the other part, which we are coordinating with the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs, there is a representation mm -hmm. from them mm -hmm. here, uh, and uh, which is uh, the program to have Saudi interns uh, in, in some of the UN organizations. We are uh, we're already are identifying the potential uh, programs. We have communicated, actually, with OCHA, and uh, we are also looking for the appropriate young Saudi boys and girls. We wanted to start with uh, a pilot program of uh, around 10, maybe five boys and uh, five girls. And we have identified some potential candidates, and I'm sure you'll see that soon. Well, that was a, a question with a great answer. <laughs> <laughs> Paul? Yeah, uh, maybe following up a little bit, linking to Vision 2030 and so on. But uh, my question, uh, in Vision 2030 or in the future, of financing of Saudi Arabia's foreign humanitarian aid, is there clarity, whether it's in Vision 2030 or a five-year plan or 10-year plan? These are big, big amounts of money uh, at a time when budgets are being cut and so on. So what do you know about the... Uh, future of financing, either for the center or for humanitarian aid. Uh, at the same time, is it all now and in the future straight budget government money? Is there any private giving, either from corporations or from individuals, encouraged to be part uh, of this effort? Uh, and I guess a final political question is, to what degree is the Saudi public uh, aware of, you know, everybody is being asked to, you know, uh, uh, cut uh, cut their expenses, and you know, people have to meet their own budgets. Uh, is there a lot of awareness? Is there public support? What's the public uh, view on the money that's being spent abroad? Thank you. Uh, also, very very important uh, two points. Now, we are conscious about the funding and you know, uh, economical constraints. And uh, uh, the uh, Vision 2030 is clear about those items, as you know. Uh, but the center also is working on that. Uh, the center is also uh, well ahead of plans for the future uh, to ensure that multi-sources for funding will continue and will be enough funding to sustain the work that we are doing as a center. Uh, we feel that we should not always depend on just government money. Uh, now, 
since the movement of the Saudi national campaign, that's the first answer to you, mm -hmm. that uh, donations from public and from business uh, corporations actually now it's, is becoming uh, under authority of the center. And we're working to put the guidelines for that soon. It will be uh, coming in the coming few months. The other issue is how we have money that can produce money for us, for the, which is the investment part of the, uh, and the center is, is working, as you know, according to the Islamic law, which is the trust, awqaf, and others. These are also in the plans that the center will, will, will have to ensure there is, there is continuous revenues that will bring money to the center. So there is a lot of work. We have good economists and financial people working with us to uh, move us in the right direction and uh, we want to see continuity. Uh, and uh, the last, which we, are, we have uh, negotiated with the Gates Foundation as a side issue, with, which is the digitalization of donation. Uh, as you know, Gates Foundation has succeeded. The other side is to move the money from the Gates to the end use, user as, as a, a, a digital way. Now we want also the other parties to move the donation from the donor to the center in a digital way and continue it back to the end user and then back the feedback mechanism. The center is also working on that uh, we, uh, and our both financial people, bankers, uh, the banks that work with us, and also uh, the, the IT people that are now building uh, a program. We hope that it, uh, and we will share it with the Gates Foundation to, they can audit it for us, and hopefully it's a, new, a unique program that maybe our partners will benefit from it in the future. Well, let's try one. Yeah. Uh, and on the public view of the Saudi Oh, public sorry, yeah, I think, sorry. For, no, actually, it's, it's a good question. With the, let me tell you, I can't, I did not do any, I mean, uh, uh, monitoring or, 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 or check it, but we had uh, a campaign for Syria. So we expected not to have a good response. We were surprised to see how much people are responding to donate. Saudi Arabia, it's, you know, it's their culture mm -hmm. that they will support those who are in need. We did not see anybody objecting to what Saudi Arabia is doing for Yemen, for Syria, for any country in the world. I mean, as I've told you, we have 38 countries in two and a half years. Uh, as a matter of fact, many of the donors came without us asking them to donate. This is how much we are seeing. Follow up a little bit on Paul's question about money, about financing. During the Sahel drought, which was, what, 10 years ago, a terrible drought in the Sahel, um, I had a discussion with people who worked for the Prince Sultan Foundation. He had his own private foundation yes, yes. that was putting money into relief work in the Sahel. Several other princes, I believe, have their own foundations. Are they now working through you and coordinating with you and putting money in there? Not yet, but we are now putting the process to have this coordination process. And that's what I told you is uh, we are not 100% fully, we are 70%, but it's coming. The mandate that every, pro we will not intervene unless we see there is an issue of, uh, against transparency. We will help them, we'll coordinate, we will protect them from, from going in w one way or the other. Do we have any other questions, well, just comments? Maybe yeah, just please. one final. Yeah. I, I'm really enjoying this conversation. Thank you, Thank you so Thank much. You. Uh, and it's, it's so important, and you're absolutely right. Uh, not enough people here in the United States know all that you're doing. I know this is Chatham House rules. No, it's not. No, it's not? Oh, wonderful, <laughs> wonderful, no, 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 because I was going to ask, I was going to ask if you would let us um, write this up and film it and project it and, and try to get the word out because I think that's important to do. Well, I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Please do. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, it's been filmed. Yes. There is no reservation to publish anything that I have said, whether it is by video, writing, or voice. Okay, good, thank you. Uh, and in fact, we will be posting it on our website, so, so it, it will be available. Um, if, there's, if there's nothing else, uh, let, let me just say on a, on a personal note, as somebody who's 
followed the progress of the King Salman uh, Center since it started, not even two and a half years ago, it's less than two and a half years, uh, uh, to congratulate you uh, uh, personally for, uh, for the achievement that you've made so far. I would say that uh, uh, the King Salman Center from its, uh, from its origins uh, has really made tremendous progress, not only in terms of a deliverer of humanitarian assistance to uh, people in need in, in Yemen and, and elsewhere in the world, uh, but also in um, uh, helping build Saudi Arabia's reputation, frankly, as a, a major contributor, as a major party a partner for humanitarian assistance all around the world. Uh, and, uh, and so this is a, a great achievement. Uh, we're, we're glad that, uh, uh, that uh, people um, uh, had the wisdom of giving you the opportunity and the mandate to, to go ahead and, uh, and uh, launch this activity. Uh, and, uh, and again, we appreciate your coming and spending a little bit of time with us to, uh, to talk about what you've accomplished. Thank you, Ambassador Freistein. I think uh, your comments uh, are highly appreciated. We, ha we hope that we can live to those expectations. And uh, if there is any credit, it's to uh, His Majesty King Salman. This is the fairest project that he took when he took office. Mm. And it's not surprising for us Saudis because he was heading the relief committees when he was governor of Riyadh. So aid is in his mind. Uh, and uh, I hope that uh, uh, my, the center and, and myself and my colleagues will be able to, to uh, meet the expectations of the country and also uh, prove to uh, our friends and allies that we will uh, do what it takes to improve uh, the relief of the human suffering. Thank you very much.